New Chargers general manager Joe Horty spoke for the last time before the 2024 NFL draft, and he made it very clear that if somebody wants to come in and get the number five pick, they're going to have to give up a king's ransom. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. We've been covering the Chargers now together for eight seasons, but this is our sixth year as the host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you to the everydayers for making us your first listen today and to make sure that you never miss the show. Go subscribe or follow for free on the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel and listen wherever you get your podcast from. David, what do we got today? Daniel, we got to hear from Chargers general manager Joe Hortiz about the draft, about the trade that is going to have to be required. If you want to come and get pick five, then we need a king's ransom. We are going to fleece you. We are not looking for a fair trade we also get to hear about his draft philosophy and how he feels about best player available and definitely going to get into some wide receivers offensive linemen and the just general philosophy of the draft yeah it was great to hear his comments on it and obviously it is hashtag smoke screen season so you have to take everything a little bit with a grain of salt but i do think there's some maybe subliminal messaging getting put out here right and today's episode is brought to you by monopoly go i admit I have a competitive side and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. David, it was great hearing from General Manager Joe Hortiz. And that's the reason we're talking about this today. We will have Trevor Sykema on Monday show, Mock Draft Monday, with one of the best draft experts in the business. Super excited. Already have it in the books and we know you guys are going to really love it. So make sure you're around for that. But let's talk about Joe Hortiz because we had to talk about the comments that he brought up today. And the thing that stood out to me the most was him talking about a potential trade back from five. Because one of the things we've talked about on and on is, hey, in Baltimore, they like trading down. But they also didn't have the fifth overall pick very often, right? And when he's talking about what it would take for them to trade down, this is what he said. Everyone has charts. It's fair, meaning that it's equal out to a fair trade when you're trading away the number one player in the draft assuming that four quarterbacks go first in this scenario. I don't know if it's necessarily always going to be a fair trade because when you have a a chance to pick the number one position player in the draft, it means a certain thing, right? So it was interesting because to me, the messaging was simple, right? It's going to take a lot for us to move off this pick because we know there's going to be very, very good players that we're passing up on if we move off. Well, and just know that we're not going to just trade back to trade back, right? Right. I mean, we know where we're at. We covet the position that we're at, and we know that we're going to have an opportunity to pick the best non-quarterback available in the draft. And if you really want to take that spot from us, then you're going to have to really make it worth our while. Yeah, and I love that. I I love it just because it's like, hey, to me, the other thing he said here that is worth noting is he said, hey, we've already gotten calls about the fifth overall pick. There are already teams that I'm sure are saying, hey, if this guy's available, this is what we want to do. And when I hear this, one of the things that tells me is like, are they kind of sending out the bat signal of, okay, what you're offering me isn't enough, right? Like, I I hear your offer, (laughs) but even if, the other thing is too, is just like, even though it might not be a quarterback you're coming up for, we basically have the number one pick in the draft, right? You're you're trading up to get the best non-quarterback in the draft. So even though you might not have the QB tax attached to it, something we've brought up a lot of times, it's still going to cost you a pretty penny, which is exactly what he should be saying. And I think he's saying, hey, step up your offer, and it's going to have to be a haul to pass up the players that are going to be available to us. But I just love kind of the sentiment, right? No fair deals. This is what he said. They have to make it attractive for us to move away from those players. The whole, it's a fair trade, it's a wash. I don't think that's trade that we're interested in. And I love that because it's just like, it it almost reminds me, I'm going to sound like Brand Staley, a Drake verse, right? A verse for a verse. That isn't a swap for me, right? Like just because, <laughs> like, just because you come on my song to do it, you know, a little yeah. verse doesn't mean I have to come on your song to do one, right? I love so what that. it tells me is just like, just because you look in the Jimmy Johnson trade chart yeah. and we're getting, you know, a similar amount of points doesn't mean that we're going to do that trade. Like if we're doing the trade, we're winning the trade. Yeah, and we're not playing it. off of that script, Daniel. We're, it, we're yeah. not. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, that's my biggest thing here is just, just like, they have to be the ones that are going to be winning the trade. And if they're not obviously winning, if they're not obviously getting surplus value from what the fifth overall pick is, which is an extremely valuable pick, 
they're not going to do it. And I think they're taking the right approach there. And it is nice to your point where you're just saying, like, we're not going to trade back just to trade back. It has to be something where we feel really, really good about what we're getting in return. Absolutely. I mean, th this is a pivotal pick for the Chargers. They know that there's a lot of holes on this roster. They know that they need to get an impact talent at the fifth overall pick. And if you are taking away that ability to pick at number five, then we're going to need more than enough compensation to make us feel good about having to move back and have to rechart and see what players are going to be available with the package that you're going to present us. And I think the other thing it says too is like, we're okay picking up. Yeah, we're good. You know, we don't have to trade. And I think of that Monty for you know, the Cardinals GM and him wheeling and dealing on the phone and yeah. moving back and the moving back up. And there's been a sentiment about the Cardinals potentially making a trade with the Vikings, getting an extra first round pick and then giving only part of what they get back for that to the Chargers to move back up to five and get, you know, Marvin Harris. It almost feels like it's a direct response to that, right? <laughs> it it kind of does to me just because it's like they're saying we're OK to stay here. Like we're not yeah. just going to take something because you think it makes sense because you think it adds up that's not what we're here to do and i also right. thought it was interesting when he was talking about how far are they willing to trade back right how far are you willing to move down the board because there is a drop off of players at a certain point and what he said is i would never cap us i don't think we should cap ourselves but you kind of create layers of okay this is about how far i'd want to go back that's part of the strategy if this then this i wouldn't cap us but again it has to make sense for us too and i think that's a big part of it because just because you might be giving, you know, more value, if you're taking the Chargers away from a guy they really, really want to get in the top 10, maybe they still don't do it. And maybe there is a spot where they're like, okay, well, we could create, you know, a little bit more value for us. We could get a couple extra picks, but still be in the range to get a Malik Neighbors, and still be in the range to get a Roma Dunze or someone like that. So that is the other thing here is just not if they're going to trade back. But how far they're willing to trade back because once you start getting to 11 with the vikings right once you start getting to the broncos and the teens right after that then it becomes a totally different story and maybe they don't feel like they can get the guy they need to get at that spot so i did think it was interesting too just like how far they're willing to trade back maybe they're not even looking at a certain past a certain point as far as like hey if you're picking at 15 and you're the colts or someone like that that want to come up for a weapon like we don't have anything for you because we're not moving back that far. Yeah, that kind of that's what it kind of seemed like to me just reading in between the lines. He says, yeah, I'm not going to put a cap on it, but it kind of seems like he's putting a cap on it. It's like, the, yeah, yeah, like obviously we don't we're not going to just outright say that we're, we're not going to entertain any offers from any you know people that are you know way further down the line in the draft. Like obviously we're going to yeah. listen and, and we have to do that. We have to do our due diligence and listen to offers, but you have to, you know, we have we have to make sure that we're getting to a level where we're still taking a player that we covet, that we like, that we have at that slot, at that value. And if we're not getting that, then we're not going to just trade back all the way and, you know, you know, miscalculate where we want to be able to take that, take our value and get our players. And I think to a certain extent, what he's saying is like, yes, we want to get more capital, right? But at the same time, we still want to come away with a really good player. And we yeah. know that we have a chance to get a really, really good top tier player up to a certain extent, right? How many guys that they have great as top 10 guys? How many guys do they have great as top 15 guys, right? Those are the things that we don't have, you know, that we don't know right now. But I did think it was interesting as far as just like, why trade back? Why not just stick and pick, right? What's the benefit? He basically said this, you know, the team has holes. He said, yeah, that it's just like baseball. The more bats you get, the more chances you have at hits. And that's the thing is like, you can feel really good about a player, but the draft is still a crapshoot to a certain extent. So you want to just get as many darts as you can throw at the board and hope one of them sticks. So even though we knew, we know there's good players here, that would be the reason we could still trade back. I mean, we see it all the time, Daniel. I mean, the, the draft is one of the most unpredictable things in yeah. all of professional sports. You just don't know what team values what player and how much they put the value in to that particular player. And we see it every single year. Yeah. Players go way higher than we ever expect them to. They go way lower than we expect them to. We just have to see it unfold. And that's why watching the draft is definitely magic and a ton of fun. And it should be even crazier this year than other years. Another thing he said, too, is just like you have to have contingencies in place. He said at one point, like, I'm expecting four quarterbacks to go first. But he's Ready like, I'm also anything. expecting three. I'm also anticipating two. Right. Yeah. You have to have the contingency plans made. But they feel like if they stay at five, they're going to get a really good player. But will they take the best player available? Because that's what every GM says. They all go into their first draft and they tell you 
to your face, I'm going to take the best player available. And then they turn around and don't always do it. And we're going to know really quickly if Joe Ortiz is a man of his word. At the same time, he brought receipts. And that's something you don't always get from the general manager. So we're going to get into that and the rest of the great stuff he had to say about the Chargers draft strategy and more on today's Locked on Chargers podcast. I do need to tell you guys, though, that today's episode couldn't exist without sponsors like Yahoo Finance. Let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation, to pay off your debt or your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and your financial freedom, right? With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools that you need in order to help reach that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you the tools and data that you need in one place, and they are the number one finance destination producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures that you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. David, I want to talk about best player available because like I said before, it's something you could say until your face turns blue, right? But it doesn't matter because it's still like we saw with Tom Telesco many times, right? Doesn't always mean that you're not going to just feel like you have a need that you have to address. So even going into this draft, I think the good thing about the Chargers is also a bad thing about the Chargers where they could almost always take the best player available and still feel like they're fitting a need, right? So like, yeah. There's not many positions that you could take where you're just like, oh, well, they obviously avoided, you know, or just didn't go with a huge need because you could argue there's a few of those on the roster already. But when he was talking about, hey, what's the strategy here? He said what we thought he'd said. He said, when we're talking about best player available versus the biggest need, which is what every GM is kind of weighing, I think that it's best player available. When you get a chance to add a great player, you add them. That's how we're going to approach it. And I think the interesting thing here, David, is we're not going to have to wait very far into the first night of the NFL draft to see if he's going to be a man of his word or right or or to, to make it feel like he's taking the best player available. Because we've said over and over again, if you take someone like a Joe Alt over someone like a Marvin Harrison Jr. over someone like a Malik Neighbors, it's hard for me to think that you're not just trying to fill the physical trenches agenda and taking someone who's a lesser player at five because it is what you kind of think is more of a need. I mean, yeah, we're going to know right away. I mean, that's going to be one of the most interesting things that happen early on in this draft is what are your true intentions and who do you really think is the best, highest valued player in this draft? Because I think universally it's pretty much accepted that these wide receivers are the top non-quarterback players in this draft, and it is a consensus thought. So yeah. if you go up there and you take a Joe Alt over and you have a Marvin Harrison Jr. that's on the board, then my goodness, that's a nightmare situation for me. Like, I, I mean, that's not something that I want to see. It'd be but, impossible to talk me into right. as far as him being the more talented, the better prospect. Th- there's just no way. And, and yeah, I understand there's different positions, but it's about what player is going to impact your team the most effectively, the quickest. And yeah. I'm sorry, but there's no way you're going to convince me that you have a tackle that you're going to have to move to the other side Yeah, that is going to be more valuable and more impactful right away than a wide receiver that is going to step up and step in right away and be productive and probably be your number one wide receiver as soon as they walk in the locker room yeah and i mean i think we've always kind of asserted that whether it's you know marvin harrison jr whether it's malik neighbors whether it's even a roma dunze they probably go in as wide receiver one and can produce at or near that level even as a rookie i think marvin harrison jr obviously is most polished the most kind of sure thing if there ever is one which there really isn't right but this is the other thing too, right? Like you don't know where these guys are on their board. They could That's be right. looking at their board and their board doesn't have a single quarterback on it, right? But when they look up, maybe they see Marvin Harrison Jr. number one, and maybe it's Joe Alt number two, right? Maybe they have Joe Alt rated above a Malik Neighbors, rated above a Romo Dunze. I wouldn't, but it doesn't mean that they won't. But I just think right. that if they end up doing that on draft night and go with someone like Joe Walt, it's going to feel a little bit disingenuous and it's something that you know general managers do all the time so it's not like it's something that's totally foreign or we haven't seen before it's just like right. i'm not going to be able to buy that argument 
right? If you're going to try to sell me Joe Wall over any of those guys, or even over a Brock Bowers, right? Even if it's more of a, a positional value. And to be clear, we're not saying that the trenches aren't important. Like, no. they are. We know that. And yes, Justin Herbert's gotten hurt a couple of times while in the pocket. Also gotten hurt, you know, with his fingers on, on the helmets, which freak accidents and stuff like that. Sure. We know the, the trenches are important. But also, this is a very deep offensive line draft. Just because you don't take one in the first round doesn't mean it's not going to be addressed. I would be hard-pressed to expect the Chargers not to take an offensive lineman at some point oh, yeah. in this draft. And he said as much. And we'll yeah. get to what he says about the offensive line too. But we're still like, if you want to trade back and get one, that's fine. Yeah. As long as the value is lining up with your pick, yeah. I can get behind it. It's yeah. just taking one specifically at five. If you want to take one at 11, like there's a few guys that are probably worthy of that. And, and I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't bat an eye, you know, but it's just like, if you're taking one at five, it's just going to be hard for me to take that, you know, take your word for that. But yeah. it was interesting because unlike some other GMs, when they say that, he brought receipts <laughs> and he yeah. said, hey, I will show you exactly where we went best player available over need. And he said this, and when asked to kind of provide an explanation, he said, yeah, I think Kyle Hamilton, I mentioned it earlier, we signed safety Marcus Williams in free agency that year and paid him. Then we turned around and took Kyle when no one thought we would. We already had Chuck Clark at starting at the other safety spot. We had two starting safeties. So we ended up just taking the best player on the board. And I think that was very interesting and kind of a very good response, David, just because it's like, well, I can show you because we didn't need a safety. But when someone like Kyle Hamilton falls there, who's now, you know, one of, if not the best safety in the league, you take him anyways, even if it's not a position of need. It's so refreshing to me because how many times did we hear Tom Telesco spew? We're going to take the best player available. We're going to take, and how many times was it abundantly clear and obvious that they took the position of need over the best player available. I think totally. we saw that over like four or five different times over the 10 years that Tom Telesco was the general manager of the Chargers. So having a general manager say, hey, I believe in best player available and I have proof showing you that I believe in that and I have not just saying it, I have done it. That is definitely very refreshing for me to see. Yeah, and I think with Tom Telesco, the thing about him is it's like sometimes everything kind of came together and, and oh, the yeah. stars aligned right and he ends up with a justin herbert at six yeah. he ends up with a rashawn slater at 13 he ends up with a derwin james at 17. so yeah. sometimes he could argue i did take the best player available right but it's hard to argue that with other guys hard to argue that with mike williams it's hard yeah. to argue that with jerry tillery it's hard to argue that with zion johnson even quentin john i mean zion johnson you had trent mcduffie right there mike williams you obviously had patrick mahomes that went after that right jerry tillery there's several guys that went after him that you could yeah, definitely I don't make an talk about for. that one yeah no 100 <laughs> even last year with quentin johnson like the better receiver went the pick after quentin johnson did right and, and you ended wanted up going to say flowers with the, your stereotype like with what you wanted with what you thought you needed at wide receiver based on you know kind of what your metrics were of, of a star wide receiver right and now yeah well, quentin johnson we'll see what happens but sure he kind of reiterated just the best player available approach when talking about the offensive line because he said this when he was asked if they need any starters he said I think we can go out there and play football today. I do believe that 100%. Again, the best players, you just take them. What you do is create great depth and great competition. Then the best players play. And he also added on to that, we want to continue to add at all positions, but at the offensive line specifically. There's a lot of talent in there. I really think with our scheme, their coaching, the players themselves, I really expect them all to have a great year this year. But if we're able to go and bring in an offensive lineman that goes and beats out one of the other offensive linemen that we have, that's still a great thing for our team. That competition is great. So I do think he's saying, you know, because that's the other kind of underrated part of the whole offensive line talk, right? We're talking so much about how we expect this offensive line coaching staff now to improve the guys they already have. Yeah. But then going out there and saying they need a right tackle in round one. So it's like, does the, the improvement that you're getting only apply to Zion Johnson? Does yeah. it only apply to Jamari Sawyer, right? It, it doesn't work with Trey Pipkins. You know what I mean? So like, I think that we kind of overlook that at times, but he's saying, hey, it doesn't mean we're not going to, if the best player available is an offensive lineman there, just because we have five guys that we feel really good about doesn't mean we're not swooping them up. I just think that the creating the depth part of it is such a key important note to, to highlight here because 
how many times have the Chargers been so top heavy and just had great top end talent, but not had the depth to be able to sustain the injuries that inevitably creep up on them every single season. Yeah. So getting guys that are best player available and building that depth can help mitigate the difference in level of play between your starters and your backups. That only just creates a better, well-rounded, more balanced football team. Couldn't agree more. And I mean, when's the last time the Chargers had a season where they didn't lose one of their best offensive linemen for most of the year, right? Last year, Corey Lindsley. The year before that, Rashawn Slater. The year before that, I guess you'd probably say Brian Bulaga. Like, the list goes on and on. Like, it's always been a thing. They always lose somebody. And you need somebody who's going to be able to step up. And that's the one thing they've been consistent about is, hey, we need to build depth here. So the offensive line will be addressed, and they will at least add competition. Doesn't mean they're taking them at five. Doesn't mean they're taking them in the first round. Maybe not, and they trust their coaching staff to develop and improve the guys that they have, but they're going to keep continuing to put an emphasis on that position, whether it's in the first round or later. But we do have more great stuff to get into, including Joe Hortiz being asked, okay, when push comes to shove, who's making the final pick? Is it you? Is it Jim Harbaugh? Is it the ownership group having to say? And he says, it's me. I'm the one that makes the pick at the end of the day. I'm the one that picks the player. So even if Jim Harbaugh wants an offensive lineman, just Joe Hortiz want an offensive lineman at five, that's what we're going to get into and more on today's Locked On Chargers podcast. First, though, I need to tell you guys that we've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure how your team is going to pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, you lift your head up, and you say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much money from my friends as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches in the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. And there's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. That's definitely my favorite part. Maybe, you know, just being a Charger fan, I'm just bitter and just only wanted to see my friends go down instead of trying to build up my own empire, but to each their own. And you can either charge other players for rent on your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends, if you have to, to crack open community chests and in, in, in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, David, well, it's time to get into the rest of Joe Hortiz's press conference here, and he has a, a lot of enlightening things to say, and I loved hearing from him, especially this time of the year, as he goes into his first draft as the Chargers general Just manager. He's a real dude, man. Definitely a different, less robotic, more genuine feel to him. Yeah. But maybe he's just a dirty mastermind, right, that's just telling <laughs> us all what we want to hear, too, because I hope there's a little bit of that in him as well. But before we get into who makes the final pick on these things, I do need to tell you guys, make sure you're checking out the Locked On NFL Mock Draft, which is all available now, and you can see how everyone pours the praise on us because we had trade offers, people wanted to trade up with us, we stuck to our guns, we didn't get a good enough offer, and we went with Marvin Harrison Jr. So you can find that on Locked On NFL, you can find it on our channel as well, they're dropping all of the picks have now been made, all of the picks are out there, but you also get to see how the rest of the Locked On local hosts react to it and the Locked On NFL Draft experts as well, so make sure you guys check that out on YouTube or the Amazon Fire free channels on the app. So make sure you guys go check that out. But I thought it was interesting what Joe Hortiz had to say about who makes the final pick. And to me, David, basically the thought was this. He said, I'm the one who picks the player. But when I tell you it's a collaborative process, it's a collaborative process. So everyone's involved, but when push comes to shove, I'm the guy that's pulling the trigger. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I think because there's definitely a, a lot of, I mean, including us, you know, indecision on, who is the going to be the head honcho? Who's going to have the final say? Is it going to be Jim Harbaugh? You know, is he going to be the one that says, "Hey Joe, uh, hey Joe, this is the guy I want. Go out and get him." Right? And Joe Hortiz is saying, "No, uh, uh, that's not how things work. I'm the one that's making the pick. I'm the final boss. I'm the guy that's making that final decision. I want everyone's input. I want to hear what everyone has to say. I'm going to yeah. take that input." But at the end of the day, I'm the one that's picking up the phone and I'm the one that's calling the player to let them know that I'm selecting them to be a charger. And that's how it should be, right? And if I'm Joe Hortiz, I would say, why did you bring me here? If yeah. not for me to be making these big calls, if that's not it. for me to tell you who I think the best player available is here. And I'm going to take in all the information. I'm going to get everyone's input on it. You can tell me you really like a guy, but at the end of the day, I'm the one building this roster. And if you don't let me have all of the control, then it's not just it's just not going to work right yeah. like if you have too many cooks in the kitchen it's just not going to get what you want so he also said 
it's how it's been with the charge before he got there, which I'd say, eh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Many people get a say on it, but he has the final say. And that's the thing. It goes back to this. Like, we know, you know, everyone talks about, hey, can Jim Harbaugh pass up an offensive lineman in the first round? Can Jim Harbaugh not look at a guy like J.C. Latham and think to himself, well, I could get five yards of carry behind that guy every single time if we brought him in, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, that might not be what Joe Hortiz wants. Like, I, I, and I hope, uh, being the, the talent evaluator and the scout that Joe Hortiz has been, that he can make that decision even if he doesn't think that's who Jim Harbaugh wants, right? And he did talk about Jim Harbaugh and kind of the benefits of him coming from college and his coaching staff having all that inside information. And he's going to use all that. But he gets the last pick, right? And I think yeah. it's very interesting to think, you know, kind of what that war room is going to look like. But it was also interesting hearing what he thought about this wide receiver class. Maybe it's one of these things, David. He, he's trying to let us down easy, the fans, and, and, and preparing us. Or he's putting up a great, great smoke screen. And this is what he said. I'll say it again. I'll say it next year. And I'm going to say it five years from now. I can promise you wide receiver is going to be a deep position in the draft every year. We have our orders. And he also said in a separate part, then a guy goes in the fifth round and sets the rookie receiving record. So is he, you know, Puka Nakua, is he saying, hey, we don't have to draft a wide receiver in the first round to get a great receiver. We don't have to draft one early to get the guy that we really want. Or he could just be setting up a smoke screen like, yeah, we may take a wide receiver. We may not. It's, wide receiver's always there. We're always going to have a chance at one, right? So maybe you don't think that we're going to. Maybe you, we want you to think we're taking an offensive lineman. And that's kind of the beauty of this time of year, David. It could really be any of those things. Yeah, th this one you got to kind of take with a little bit of a grain of salt here. I think it's definitely a, well, we, we want you to hear this, but I don't know if we actually are going to do this. Yeah. But we want you to know that we think that we can find wide receiver talent anywhere in the draft. And they're going to be more pro ready because this is a passing league. And yeah. it is. Obviously, you know, the, the quarterbacks are, are the highest paid players in the National Football League for a reason, right? Because the passing game is king. And yes, these receivers are important and we're going to get one, but you don't know when we're going to take one. Yeah, I also just talked about, hey, like these passing camps, these seven on seven camps, if you're unfamiliar with it, like seven on seven where there's no offensive lineman, it's basically just, you know, linebackers, defensive yeah, beat backs the man going in front up of you. against running backs, quarterbacks, and wide receivers. And just, you know, nobody's getting tackled. It's two-hand touch. When I was playing, it was called passing league, but that's something that was big. Like during the off season, that's where, what we got up for, right? Yeah. Like I played linebacker and it's like, Hey, we have a tournament at SDSU this weekend, right? Going up against cathedral or some team like yeah. that. And, and that's a big thing, but that didn't know that hasn't always been a thing. And basically what he's saying there is like these wide receivers are getting started so early. They're learning the finer nuances so much. They're getting to work so much in the off season on their craft that they're just coming out of college at such a high level, such yeah. a level of polish that you can expect early contributions from them, maybe where you couldn't in the past. And it was more of a learning curve. It doesn't feel like that anymore. So I do think there's talent up and down the draft. But as he also said in this, there's a drop-off. There's a drop-off on the offensive line at a certain point. There's a drop-off at receiver at a certain point. So just because you can get a receiver, when's the next time you're going to have the, the chance to get a generational prospect, a, a number one wide receiver in a draft class? This might be his only chance. And guess what? Look, only a year ago, right? There's probably four, maybe five players that would go before any of the wide receivers that were taken last year, and it didn't start until the 20s. So while he's saying that, not every year is the same, and you don't always get a top three like you're getting this year. So he also talked about J.K. Dobbins, which I thought was interesting because someone that he helped draft once upon a time in Baltimore, a former second-round pick, and he said this, I had a chance to be with him for four years, a special competitor. He wants to be here. And he also said this, David, which I thought was interesting when talking about his injuries, he said, bad luck. I was there for both injuries. It was a low tackle and then an awkward tackle. He's in great shape now and he's recovering really well. And that tells me this. I think that they feel a little bit better about his injury history because they can explain some of it, right? It's yeah. not a non-contact injury. It's not these soft tissue things that keep popping up. It was a couple of freak plays and that's just playing NFL football. And maybe that made it a little bit easier to sign a guy who's, you know, played in 24 games and missed 43. And also, we just we see it time and time again that relationships are important when it comes to free agents, when it co comes to coaching hirings. It, we see it at, every single day, all the time. And also, I thought it was really uh, important that he said that J.K. Dobbins should be ready for training camp. And I think that's an important thing, but they're not going to rush him. And there's no reason to because, as, as he put it, they're not playing games until September. Yeah, and I think the big thing is just like you don't want to rush it. But the quicker he can kind of get out there, the quicker he can start getting full trust in those knees again, full oh, trust yeah. in the Achilles, right? And just not feel like every time he's making a cut, like something might just go, right? Yeah. And I think maybe 
having it be the tackles, right, and, and having it happen from weird tackles makes it Because most of the time as, it's mental, right? You got to get over that mental hurdle. So, hurdle. so much of it is mental. And, and yeah. I think especially with non-contact injuries, because yeah. it's like, I just did something normal yeah. and my knee gave out, right? It's a little bit different in the way it happened with him, where it's just like, hey, these freak tackles happen. Guess what? If they don't tackle me, then I can't really get hurt based on that, you know, that logic. So I thought it was interesting. And he also just said what we said yesterday, right? Taking J.K. Dobbins doesn't stop them from taking another running back in the draft. And I don't think it will. And I think they will end up with a running back. And he said, if you get a chance to take great players, theme of this entire press conference, you take them. All you do is create great depth. You don't turn away a great player who can help you, even if you may be a little bit deeper at that position. So I heard everything I wanted to hear from Joe Hortiz, but you haven't heard everything we want you to hear from Trevor Sycamore, who is going to be our guest for mock, mock draft Monday, the final mock draft Monday of the off season. So I'm so excited to get into you guys with that because we already have it. We know it's great, and you guys are going to want to hear it. So to make sure you don't miss Trevor Sigma on Monday's show, make sure to go subscribe or follow for free on the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel and listen wherever you get your podcast from. You also find the show every day on our social media. You can find it on my Twitter at Dan Talk Sports. David's at Dro Talk SD in the show's page at Lockdown LAC. You can also hit us up on Instagram at Lockdown Chargers where we post the show every day and our Lockdown Chargers Facebook page as well. The draft is almost here. We're recording this on Thursday. It's a week away, and it's going to get hot and heavy, so we will have our Mock Draft Monday with Trevor Sigma, our final seven-round Mock Draft, our final predictions on what's going to happen on draft day, and we're so excited to bring that to you guys because it is your team every day. But until Monday, guys, take it easy, and go Bolts.